Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so um, I think we'll uh, we'll get going, guys. Um, if that's cool with everyone. Okay, so um, welcome everyone to the twentieth uh, WSA webinar that we've done. Um, my name is Tim True, um, and I run Sup Bristol um, in Bristol, um, and I'm one of the trainers here at WSA as well. Um, if you're new to the WSA, then welcome. Um, Essentially, we're SUP and SURF specialists. We run training and we support schools all over the world. Um, WSA is also a member of 1% for the planet, um, which means basically that it gives back 1% of revenue, membership, training, holiday fees every year to environmental causes. Um, this year, we're splitting it between Surfers Against Sewage, which I guess you've all heard of, and Dan's organization, uh, Save Our Rivers. Um, so being part of the uh, WSA family really does go towards something good. Um, if you've enjoyed these talks, we're running an industry day in October um, with, um, with loads more talks in real life. Um, and we'll give you more on that at the end. Um, so we're chatting today uh, with Dan Yates from Save Our Rivers. Um, Dan is an amazing whitewater kayaker um, and I've had the pleasure of paddling with him over the years. Um, and he set up Save Our Rivers to help those of us that love the outdoors um, to fight back against developments that would damage ecosystems, um, ruin rivers, oceans, and destroy essentially the playgrounds that we love using. Um, so while we're chatting, um, if you could put your questions in the chat, that would be fantastic. Uh, we've got a couple of people here saying they can't hear the audio. You got it now? Sweet, amazing. Cool, and um, we might not be able to get through all of the questions, but yeah, keep them coming and um, let's just try and get as much dialogue as we can. It's really interesting if we get lots of conversation going on, okay? Sweet, so um, welcome. Welcome, Dan. Um, let's kick it off. So um, so we've paddled together on several kayaking trips over the years um, and you've had an amazing uh, life really traveling the world with your kayak uh, for, for quite quite a number of years. Um, what, just could you, I mean, just give a bit of information about your background um, where you've come from really and what led you to get involved in environmental activism in the first place? Um, I suppose, so I got into kayaking uh, when I was a little kid. I've probably been kayaking since I was about seven, um, but probably like loads of people who do, who are into whitewater kayaking, I suppose it really, I really took off with doing it at university. So that's when I started traveling more, uh, getting abroad, you know, going kayaking places that weren't just in the UK or, 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 or nearby. And it, it was sort of during traveling around going to, you know, South America or, or Norway or Africa or places like that. that we, when you really started, I really started to notice uh, the prevalence of, of dams on rivers that we were paddling or um, almost it, it became a bit of a rush like a few years ago to almost oh we've got to go and paddle this river now because there's going to be a dam built on it in the next couple of years and the river's going to disappear and I know that was the last trip that we did together on, mm. on the Zanzi was because we, we you know we had news that the, the dam was starting being starting to be built there and we all wanted to get you know one last trip on the Zanzi before, before that river was going to disappear so there's, there's this sort of ever-growing list of rivers that were that were disappearing from the world um, and, and that's what got me interested in the impacts of hydroelectric development on rivers and things uh, and I started reading up about it and, and you know sort of becoming more informed but it, but it wasn't until there was an application on a river right next to where I live in North Wales that, that kind of drove me to actually do something about it so uh, uh, the power company RWE, which is a German-based multinational energy company, um, produced plans to build a dam and a hydroelectric scheme on the Ferry Glen section of the Avon Conway, which is a river that um, probably one of the better whitewater rivers, or I would say the best whitewater river in the UK. Um, I, you know, and. and good to the point that I deliberately moved my entire life and family to live within five minutes of this river uh, and then having you know sort of made my life here 10 years after that some power company wants to build a dam and stick it in a pipe uh, and that's what drove us to to go from being worried about these things to actually becoming active 
some kind of just out of it. And we we set up a campaign called Save the Conway, which was Save Our Rivers' first campaign. And that we started that in 2000 and end of 2013. 2013 was when that all kicked off. And that was that was the beginning for us. Brilliant. And it's gone from there to you've done campaigns all over the place, haven't you? Um, what, what has he been doing this week? You've been in Austria, well, virtually in Austria this well, week. Well, yeah, uh, unfortunately, only virtually in Austria because I couldn't actually get there myself because of, uh, obviously, because of um, travel restrictions. So you can get into Austria currently if you live in Germany or Switzerland, I think. Um, I think that's the only people who are allowed to go to Austria at the moment. So, um, but we've been doing it virtually. There's a, there's a really good whitewater community out in Austria, uh, including uh, a few British guys that live out there that have been repping for us um, there. The, the largest free-flowing river left in the Tyrol area of Austria, one of the big provinces there, is a river called the Utz. Mm. Uh, first hydroelectric scheme planned for the Utz. There's a, there's a series of about seven schemes planned for that river. Uh, and the first scheme has been disputed by the locals there for probably... 10 or 15 years it's been in and out of court there's been various different legal disputes between um, a local kayaker NGO uh, a local residents uh, association and WWF Austria uh, but right at the beginning of the coronavirus lockdown in Austria the diggers rolled in and have started work on that mm. on that despite the fact that there's still two outstanding legal complaints against it so so they, they basically used the coronavirus lockdown in, in Austria to get in there when no protesters could, could move in to stop them. They wow. started with that. Um, so that's been going on since probably the beginning of April. We've been working on that campaign with the partners out there. And then on Wednesday, uh, there was a protest in Innsbruck uh, outside the, the government building there and the petition that we've been asking people to sign that hopefully a, a few people in Europe maybe signed as well, seen it on Instagram or, or Facebook was handed over with over 22,000 uh, signatures to the, the environment minister, who's also the deputy leader of Tyrol and the leader of the Green Party in Tyrol as well. So wow. handed, handed that petition over there, which, which has gone kind of worse and better than we expected all, all at the same time, because uh, during the handover, the deputy, uh, you know, the deputy leader of the Tyrolean government, who's also the environment minister, um, got so frustrated that he called the, the WWF representative uh, a disgusting bitch in German, uh, which now made, meant our little protest has hit every German-speaking newspaper across Germany and Austria. There's now a petition out to get this guy to resign, uh, and we've had vastly more media exposure. From it. Brilliant. That sounds fantastic. Good, good bit of experience. Yeah, went, went really well. Yeah, we obviously baited him into doing something, something controversial. So. Yeah. So, so um, I guess like you've kind of touched on it there, but your approach is quite different to. Um, we've had like um, um, yeah, people like Cal Major, Sean Sykes on here, um, doing these talks where um, people doing very, uh, very physical things, very um, a lot of publicity. Um, paddling, picking up litter, um, I don't know, um, I guess Extinction Rebellion, a lot of marching, all that sort of stuff. Um, your approach seems very different. It's very um, sort of behind the scenes. Um, is that correct? So a lot of writing yeah. and um, less glamorous stuff. It is. We do, we do the really boring activism. Yeah. Uh, activism for nerds is what we do. So what we try and do is use the existing legal structures that are already there to, to affect the change that we want to, that we want to make. So uh, an awful lot of the work we do, uh, particularly in Wales, um, is, is objecting to developments that are planned which will impact rivers uh, or, or parts of the national, other parts of the national park. So, uh, and the way we do that is by using the planning system. Um, so the planning system in the UK is definitely not perfect. There's a lot of issues with it, but everybody does have a right to respond. And if you can understand the planning system and you can learn about the intricacies, you can make you can make your objections to developments um, particularly effective. So if, you, if you're using the right legal language, if you're presenting the correct evidence to you know, planning authorities, if you understand the laws that 
developers have to stick to and planning authorities have to stick to you can you can be really quite effective in terms of how you can either block developments or alter the way that they're going to be built so they're less so they're less harm so we do a lot of work through the planning system and then also we do work through um legislation as well so most legislation that, that comes forward that's going to affect the environment will have to go through uh, some form of consultation period with the public uh, and that's pretty hidden uh, so normally you only get um ngos or um or corporations responding to to consultation changes so for instance if there's a consultation change about uh you know looking at what what sean and carol probably talking about if there's a consultation change about a law that might come in to affect uh taxes around single-use plastics or bottles generally you'll only get people like you know the big um manufacturers will be expected to respond to that or a big ngo might respond to that whereas we're trying to find uh those consultations and give just normal members of the public who are into doing their outdoor sport, who love those places, and give them the information they need and uh, the systems like in place so that they can make responses as well. So we've done consultation response, campaigns for consultation responses on um, laws that we're gonna change, secondary legislation that was gonna change the environmental protection of national parks in Wales. And we've done another one on uh, planning laws, which we're gonna, the, 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 the the purpose of the of the legislation was to give um builders of dams and hydro schemes an ability to build those using permitted development so they wouldn't have to go through the full planning system yeah and so we've responded to consultations uh, about those and and given hundreds of people a chance to to respond to them as well so so we, those are the sort of two two main arms that, that we do so not very exciting <laughs> No getting attacked by police or mace, no gluing ourselves to buildings or dressing up in costume, yeah. waving banners. But it seems but, to be working, hey. It's, yeah. um, it's, it's working pretty successfully. Um, and it's amazing because you've all got full-time jobs and stuff on the side as well. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know um, if you ask my wife, my job's not, not terribly, <laughs> not terribly full-time. <laughs> This, the, you know, being a being an activist is definitely taking up more of my time, uh, and my day job is definitely taking up less of my time. Good, good way, good balance, good work life balance. Um, yeah. So, um, got a question here from Richard, who's um, who's going for what, one, one, something that I've struggled with actually in the past myself with various um, trips to go paddling. Um, how, he says, how do you reconcile the careful balance to invest in sustainable energy uh, energy sources in order to reduce carbon emissions? um providing alternative renewable energy over the localized impact of the river on the river so yeah i mean so first of all hyd hydroelectricity is is uh renewable but it is not sustainable you know that's 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 probably the simplest way of describing it um when you when you build a dam in a river a hydro scheme you know in a river you you break the connectivity of that river you damage its its uh its ability to transport sediment, uh, its ability to have migration of fish. So, so effectively, you, you you pretty much kill a river when you when you break it like that. And although obviously water is renewable, you know, river rivers are not. So we're not we're not we're not making any new rivers. Um, and and if you look at the impact that dams have on rivers at the moment in the UK, we now only have one percent of our river systems are completely. Clean. So we have blocked with dams or weirs 99% of all rivers uh, within the UK already. Uh, and yet, in terms of the energy we produce from that, we're only making um, one to two percent of UK energy demand through hydropower. So we're, we're sort of looking at the point where hydro, uh, you know, production of electricity from hydro has maxed out at the impact that it can have. There's, there's nothing more that that, that river systems can, can really give in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, if we've already dammed ninety nine percent of rivers in the UK for one percent of energy. I mean, damming the other one percent is not going to be, it's not going to be saving. 
planet in terms of carbon emissions, but it is going to have a very significant impact on river island ecosystems. So that's that's the sort of the first one. And when you, when you look at it globally, wo worldwide, um, the impact of hydro schemes uh, on, in a worldwide context is enormous. So we've we've got something like two thirds of the world's large rivers are now blocked with dams, um, and we produce about I think worldwide about fifteen percent of world energy is produced through hydro. Uh, again, for a loss of sixty six percent of all of our main, all of our large rivers, connectivity-wise, and if you look at the impacts of hydropower in terms of, therefore, the carbon that it emits to to produce, it's also the most carbon-intensive low-carbon technology. So, if you look at like low-carbon technologies, the least carbon per kilowatt you produce is nuclear power, and then that's followed by offshore and onshore wind and that's followed by um, solar and then that's followed by biomass but that's a tricky one because that depends on how you count the carbon like in terms of where you get your wood from and stuff that you're using with biomass and then it's and then it's hydropower so hydropower is the most carbon intensive of all renewables uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that firstly that they're, they're pretty concrete intensive things to build but also when you when you create a reservoir by building a dam you trap you, you break the carbon cycle that that river has so basically rivers take carbon from land in terms of fallen vegetation and they wash it out to sea where it's buried and sequestered as limestone in the, in the seabed yeah. and you see so you break that cycle and, and we're not sequestering carbon in that way and then those nutrients instead of going into the sea in that way, sit behind the dam and then off gas as carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. So greenhouse gas emissions from reservoirs are actually uh, somewhere in the region of about the eighth largest, have the eighth largest warming effect of any, any industry. So uh, carbon emissions from res hydro reservoirs emit, you know, have a greater warming impact than all global aviation, or more than Canada, in, you know, in terms of their activity. There. So, so those are the sort of the two reasons that they do produce a lot of carbon still, and uh, yeah, also they, uh, you know, the, the, the impact on river systems has, has reached a point where we really can't sustain any more of it. So. Cool. That's pretty. Uh... Pretty good response, Dan. Nice one. Um, yeah, so um, I guess hopefully that answers Richard's question. Um, a couple of people asking about um, nuclear fusion. Um, I don't know if you've got an opinion on that very quickly. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, it's meant to be great, isn't it? It's in all the sci fi books, but no one knows yeah. no it work yet, have they, without you know, sticking in vastly more energy than they're, than they're getting out? Yeah. Um, it's one of those things that I, I don't know. I read a book about about um, the Manhattan Project. You know, where they made the nuclear bomb in yeah, yeah, yeah. Second World War, and how America spent more. You know, fifty percent of America's entire wartime budget was spent on the Manhattan Project. You know, more. You know, more than they spent building aircraft. Companies. Okay, and it, it does make you wonder if if the world put. That and that, you know, that went that took us from a technology level of horses and carts, you know, at the beginning of the war to a nuclear bomb seven years later. Yeah, it does make you wonder if the world committed that level of resource to nuclear fusion, whether that would then be an achievable aim. But I can't imagine it ever would, you know. I don't know. Yeah, you never know. You never know. It seems to make. I don't think anyone's going to make the investment required to make it work. Yeah. Um. So I, I'm really interested in in. in you, you mentioned at the beginning of the, the 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 last chat about um sediment and fish and um the transport from the upland regions um where kind of you and I have spent a lot of our our, our kayaking years um down the river and how that I guess how that affects like the places where um paddleboarders are going to be where we're you know the coast um, estuaries. Um, how does that have an effect um, you know, downriver, I suppose, and, and on the coast as well? 
Yeah, so there's been loads of really good studies actually, mostly done around Portugal and Spain, where the, the, there's, a, there's been an awful lot of building of dams in Portugal on the inland rivers that they've got there and in Spain for both water supply and, um, and hydroelectric purposes. And obviously there's some pretty famous surf breaks out there as well. And so there's been a lot of research. There's a guy called Tony Butt, who's a, like a professor of, or a doctor of wave dynamics or something, but he's also a big wave surfer that lives in southern Spain. Um, and he's done a lot of studies on basically the, the stone and cobble transfer that these dams have broken, which, which is basically producing these gravel bars, which make these amazing surf breaks out there. That's all been stopped by these large dams that have been built. And he's been able to estimate that, you know, certain surf breaks out there have 10 to 20 years left during which time, you know, natural erosion by the ocean is going to wash away the, the gravel and the stone that makes them. And that, that's just not being replenished. Right. So we can start to lose surf breaks that way. Uh, and that's going to lead to increased coastal erosion uh, and increased erosion in estuaries as well, where you're not feeding them with you know, with the sediment that, that the idea of the, you know, the way the world works is that, um, you know, you get, you get uplift in upland areas from volcanoes or, you know, tectonic plate activity, and then rivers wash that down to the coast and build coastal, coastal areas and habitats and stuff. Uh, and that, that whole, that whole system gets broken when you, when you build the dam, that, that transport of, um, of sediment and gravel and cobbles from upland to downland is, up the upstream to downstream is, is, is cut uh, and yeah so coastal coastal regions can have a uh, really hard problem huh. and how about so you guys have been working um in kendall uh, over the last year or so um with some of the stuff they're doing in the town itself so um canalization um all this um all this sort of stuff i'm kind of interested in how um how that affects um i guess the, the, the life of the river as well like how does you know the building building on the floodplain straightening out rivers all that sort of stuff what's what's the effect of, of that on them um, on, on yeah, so Ken, Kendall's a really interesting campaign because I'm sure a lot of people see in the news recently that there's a lot of talk about what they call natural flood management which is reducing the impact of flooding on communities by slowing the flow of water from upstream you know upland areas where the rain falls into the towns where, where it gets flooded. And the idea of natural flood management is that you, you reduce the speed of that flow by giving the rivers in the upland uh, space to move. So you can have, uh, you let the river meander across its floodplain instead of canalizing it through fields. You try and reforest or replant the, the upland areas with the trees that they used to have. So that when the land, when the rain hits the land, it, it doesn't flow into the river as quickly. You increase surface right. roughness with trees, and you increase uh, evaporation and transpiration. So less of the water is hitting the river, and the water that is hitting the river is hitting the river over a, a longer period of time, as opposed to hitting it all in a big flash. And therefore, when when it gets downstream, it, it doesn't flood communities in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're doing in Kendall is they're not doing any of that at all. They're building, you know, big two meter high concrete walls at either side of the river in town, uh, which is going to necessitate the felling of about 500 mature river tri riverside trees for the centre of town. It's going to mean that the, the lovely the lovely railings that you can look over at the river at in Kendall are going to be gone, and unless you're two and a half meters tall, you won't be able to see the river anymore. Yeah. Um, and then at the entry to town. They're going to build a large dam across the river with a control gate to try and hold that water, not gradually through the catchment, but all in one big pool, you know, one big reservoir just mm -hmm. upstream. The town. And this is using basically all of the, the techniques of flood control, which have been proved to be ecologically damaging, overly expensive, and not, and not terribly effective. Um, but it's all being pushed through because there was a grant given by uh, the EU for flood prevention uh, using these traditional techniques. And obviously we're leaving the EU and the environment agency's got 75 million quid for them that is just desperate to spend uh, and is going to blow it on this, this pretty outmoded that, this pretty outmoded scheme. So we're asking for a, a bit of a pause and a bit of a rethink and a, and a look at 
spending that money uh, more effectively in upstream measures, compensating farmers for having flooding on their land, re replanting. You know, we understand that there'll need to be some um, there will need to be some hard engineering around Kendall to help prevent floods. But if that upstream management is done first, then the the hard engineering that needs to be done downstream will be will be massively reduced in scale. And that, that's what we're asking for there. Um, it's not really our campaign. We're helping out a group of local activists that are working there that ask for our help. So we're giving them advice with how to do all those sort of like how to contact all those use those legal avenues, how to run social media campaigns, how to use a website, you know, giving them web hosting stuff, how to, you know, make, how to tell their story in a way that, that engages people. So just trying to help them out with some of those things that were really hard for us to learn when we ran our first bank campaign. It'd be nice if, if we could pass that on instead of, um, instead of them having to learn it all from scratch as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so I've got quite a lot of questions on what we can do um, as, um, as paddlers, as, as individuals, um, which you've touched on very briefly there. Is now a good time to just sort of have a little chat about how, how I guess, how we can get involved um, as, as individual paddlers? Yeah, totally. I mean, obviously there's all the, the stuff that probably Cal and Sean touched on, you know, you can do your river cleans and you can be responsible to you know, damage that you, you, know, you can tidy up the place that you go and not leave it messy and things like that. And that's something that we should all be doing as individuals. But what I, what I'd recommend everything, everybody to do as well is think about the local area that they, that they go paddleboarding in or, or kayaking, in, you know, walking in, like to ride their bikes in. Find out a bit more about that area. And if, if it's your local area or even if it's just an area that you visit a lot, do some really simple things like get the planning list for that area. So once a month, there'll be, you know, the local authority or the local national park, depending on where it is, will, will release a planning list of developments. Have a look and check that none of those are going to damage the place that you like. You know, is, there, is someone going to build a car park in a meadow? Is someone going to build a hydro scheme in the river is you know is someone going to fell some woodland to, to you know, build a chicken farm or something like that and ha have a look through that planning list and, and try and make it your your job think, think of it as like you know your year's resolution should be to object to one environmentally damaging planning application each year and that's easy because there's loads like you know you're going to be spoiled for choice uh, and engage in the planning system in that way and and people don't uh, and I think that's really important. And if you see one that's going to affect a beach break, you know, and you're worried about it, contact your local surface against sewage rep, you know, or if you're worried about one that's going to impact a river, contact us at Save Our Rivers or contact your local rivers trust. The, there are NGOs out there that are helping with that as well. But, but we can't, I can't look at every planning list for, you know, every river in, in the UK and be a dad and go kayaking and go and test people's eyes for living. like it doesn't work so if you see if you see issues like that get in touch with us and we can help you out but but take a the responsibility for it yourself that's that's fantastic um so um got quite a lot of questions coming in here i'm just going to have a little look at these um so we've got a um, question about fairborn in wales and um being lost to the sea um Due to climate change i don't know if everyone's uh, seen that story it's pretty amazing i went, went to visit it recently and um yeah it's um it's pretty shocking it's pretty much below the sea um how do we reconcile the needs of the community and the inevitable effects of climate change from uh, laurie butler so i guess we're looking it's, at the um, growing, like building and on floodplains uh, i guess the growing population how, how do we how do we do more building and yeah uh, I, I think we have to accept that natural processes are an inherent part of how the world works and trying to stop natural processes has got us into a lot of the trouble that we're in like you know when we talk about the Kendall issue they're having to build two meter high concrete walls in town and a dam to prevent flooding because they've cut down all the trees in the uplands and they've straightened all the rivers in the uplands so I think we have to allow the world you know allow nature to operate naturally natural processes so we're going to lose areas to coastal erosion that that will happen um and i think what we have to accept is that 
yeah, I mean, people need to, you know, there's nothing that you can do to save Fairbourne in the long term. You can't build ever and ever bigger concrete walls and expect to hold the ocean back. It's, it's just not going to happen. You, you know, and I think in the future, we need to think about building our communities in places where they are resilient to the impacts of climate change. Instead of trying to hold nature back, we need to be working with it. So we need to not be building on floodplains and we need to not be building coastal communities anymore in areas which are going to be inundated with water in the next couple of years. Yeah. Uh, to um, build with natural processes in mind rather than building wherever we want to build and expecting to, to stop them in their tracks. Um, I think that's really interesting. And that le leads on to one of um, Emanuela's questions here. Was she saying um, that, um, how, do, how do local people feel about it? I, I, how have you found local, um, you know, local support? Have you found people have um, been pro the dam because it might be bringing in employment or it might be, um, or, you know, helping them out in some way, or have you have you have you found that people are generally working with you? I think I think certainly in terms of Snowdonia, where we've done most of our campaigns. So we started with a big campaign here, and we probably campaigned against. Oh, excuse me, I'm drinking too much beer. But uh, <laughs> is we've probably campaigned about maybe five or six different hydro schemes in Wales over the like the last five years, something like that. Fortunately, we've not yet campaigned against the dam that we haven't been successful uh, in stopping. You know, how much of that is us stopping it or how much of it is that it was going to be stopped anyway is always impossible to tell. But we've, we've certainly, almost all the other ones get built and the ones that we campaign against don't. So I think there's definitely a lot of, uh, if people draw attention to it, then the planning authority looks a bit more carefully. Um, at the very beginning of that, with our first scheme, that I would say 50% of the population at least was in favour of the construction uh, in terms of they believed that the renewable energy it was going to bring was worthwhile compared with the, the limited amount of destruction that the developer was claiming it was going to cause. The developer made a lot of talk about employment that was, was going to come with the development. But I think we were able to answer quite a lot of the questions and bust a lot of the myths that the developer was peddling about that. I mean, for instance, the largest hydro scheme we, we campaigned against here was going to provide one and a half full-time equivalent jobs long-term, which is less than the smallest tea shop in Betasakoid in Quartz, you know, that relies on tourists seeing the place looking beautiful. Um, so I think people have realised that the, 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 the lies sort of peddled around investment in local communities and jobs just doesn't hold up anymore. I think people have seen a lot of hydro schemes built here that we haven't campaigned against because we can't we can't campaign against everything because we, we just don't have the resources. Uh, people have seen the damage that, that that has caused and there's been a real shift in people's opinion of hydro schemes in Snowdonia. Now when we oppose a hydro scheme we're currently opposing one on the Cumval uh, in Snowdonia. It's on pause at the moment because of the coronavirus situation, but it, that, that campaign will be picked up again when the developer starts work again. Um, is almost, you know, we instantly see a, a big objection. You know, people are much more informed, much more concerned about these impacts, and much more aware of the limitations of the benefits that they bring. So there's been a real change of narrative here. Interestingly, in Austria, um it's much you know it's a different picture it's much more mixed there isn't a big history of people uh objecting to hydro there and that's been building up over the last couple of years and we're having to do a lot more work on um you know changing the narrative there a little bit as well but it's just getting people informed you know so that's what it's all about but here in Snowdonia there's been a massive change and so Georgie's asking here whether um people getting involved in water sports and an increased, I guess, um, appetite for getting out in the outdoors. I suppose, especially during, um, during lockdown, the last couple of weeks, we've really seen everyone getting fully into the outdoors, haven't we? Um, do you think that's increasing environmental engagement and activism? Is it making a, a difference, do you think? I think environmental 
uh, in, in, I think engagement environmental activism through outdoor sports is definitely increasing. You know, that, that's, that's for sure. Like surface against sewage are 20 years ahead of anybody else in terms of this. And, and that, you know, their membership has grown year on year on year, you know, from being 20 people in, you know, when they, when I was a kid and I joined them, um, to the, them having a turnover of over like a million so they you know they've they've really grown um protect our winters is another one that's growing year on year uh, we're certainly finding kayakers becoming more and more engaged in this as well whether that's just because there's more people doing outdoor sports and the percentage of people engaged is the same and you know and it's the same you know our slice of activists is getting bigger because the cake's getting bigger or whether it's a bigger percentage of people being engaged i'm not I'm not really sure. There's certainly an awful lot of people using the outdoors that aren't as engaged as I would like them to be. And I'm sure everyone's seen in the papers and on the internet the, the pictures of disposable barbecues and beer cans and stuff left all over beaches and things recently, which is, it, it, you know, it's pretty worrying in the fact that people have such little respect for that, you know, the places that they go. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and, and companies that, that I work with as well um, are definitely playing a role in that. So uh, we work a lot with Patagonia, and obviously they're they're fantastic at pushing environmentalism as as a core part of their message. Uh, we work with NRS, and again, um, in NRS Europe certainly is really pushing um, a real environmental ethos through its ambassador program, um, and expecting people to who are sponsored by them to paddle to, to make, you know, a big commitment to becoming environmental activists and, and supporting campaigns as well. So it is changing, but whether it's never enough, is it? No, no, slow, slow going. What can we do as, um, as instructors? Like, um, you know, we're working with uh, potentially the next generation here, um, taking kids out on the water. What can, what can we be doing to, to instill that kind of attitude? <laughs> I think it's knowledge, isn't it? I, it would be great to see if every, you know, every outdoor course had an environmental aspect in it. Not, not necessarily preaching about activism, but just even if it's just an understanding of the surroundings that you're in uh, on an environmental level, it, you know, the species that you're seeing and possibly the threats that they might be under by. You know, by. I know there's a lot of good work going on with um hill walkers up here in snowdonia uh a lot of the, the sort of mountain leader guides and stuff are going on there's a guy up here who works for Casa brennan who's running um uh environment courses for mountain leaders and things you know teaching them about the different plants that you might see and the threats that they might be on mm. you know identifying you know, different birds and things so if if as a a sup instructor you can point out you know five different sorts of seabird and and talk about the importance of those as uh, uh, in amongst your in amongst your normal lesson mm. just get people as psyched about seeing the natural habitat they're in as they are about paddling less up that's that would be fantastic yeah it makes it way more interesting as well doesn't it it's another level to sort of add on to your to your, your teaching and your yeah, and, and, and and to see people buzzing about the, the natural world is pretty pretty cool really yeah, I mean, it'd be great for someone to come off a SUP Bristol course and go, you know, oh, it was great. I was able to do a headstand on my board. Plus, I saw like a cormorant and, you know, a razorbill and an oyster catcher or something like that. Absolutely. Um, we saw a, a, um, a heron eating a mole yesterday. It picked a mole. I've never seen a, a real mole in, in, in real life, but it picked it up out of the hedgerow and it, it flew across us paddling past with, with it in its mouth. Maybe. <laughs> That's like proper nature is cruel stuff, that is Yeah, 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 absolutely. Lion King stuff for life right there. It, it didn't do it quickly either. Um, <laughs> um, right, so um, yeah, let's, let's continue. Sorry, I won't get uh, sidetracked with chats about moles. Um, da -da -da. Let's have a look through these questions. We've got quite a lot here. Yeah, so when you're campaigning, um, do you find that there's a 
what's the most what's the most powerful um way to get hold of um the way to get through to developers is it is it um from a from from an environmental science point of view is it the recreational benefits or you know economics um what do they what do they get shut down by or is it just a mix of developers will give up because of economics that's pretty much the only reason the developer will ever give up because all they care about is money uh, is the experience that we found so a lot of what we do is just basically just trying to make it too expensive for them. so if for instance you can a developer wants to take i don't know like 75 percent of the water out of a river to produce electricity and leave 25 percent in 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 the river as a compensation environmental flow if you can make the case where, oops, excuse me, I've got the hiccups. Uh, if you can make the case where, for environmental reasons, that flow that they can take can, should only be 50%, then they're going to make you know 25% less electricity and 25% less money, and then often they'll give up for that reason. So, so developers, it's all about the economics. Uh, turning the um, the regulators, you know, to reject a scheme is all about it's just the the law you know you, you you're never going to get them on heartstrings this place you know we really love this place please don't mess it up is, is never going to work on anyone but if you can say you know we don't believe that this scheme uh meets european habitat regulations for this reason or we believe it's going to break european water framework directive uh for these reasons and you can give them scientific proof of that either through uh you know studies that you you've done yourself or whether you have to employ uh employ someone or get a volunteer ecologist or someone to write a report for you then that, that's what works um and it and it really depends on each scheme individually what what you're going to kind of target if you, if you know what i mean so uh we did a, a campaign last year on so we're going to build a dam on just upstream of on Cuffid on the Avon Crigwy. Um, and that one was damaged ancient woodland. So you know, ancient woodland is a is a protected habitat, and we were able to prove by going through all the uh, the planning applications that they were going to lose a third of the trees within that ancient woodland. And and that's what stopped that scheme. Uh, so it's different on everyone, but so, so you're really looking for those like loopholes and trying to well i mean they're, i mean they're not really loopholes they're they're laws that should be being adhered to you know and and that developers are trying to minimize the evidence of the damage that they're going to cause so that they they're not shown to be breaking laws um and then you know they're trying to slip them under the under the radar and then regulators are possibly trying to hope that the public aren't going to notice that maybe the one isn't quite meeting you know these different laws because they want to pass it because it's, it's a stressful one to, re to yeah. reject you know because then developers complain and it causes them a headache so mm -hmm. it's just basically holding people accountable to the laws that exist at the moment we, we have really good environmental regulation in this country and across europe uh it's just really poorly adhered to that's that's the problem that we've got wow. That's brilliant. Brilliant that you're doing it. Um, we've got um, Georgie here saying, um, sounds like a lot of hard work. How do you know when to, wh when to stop? And how, you know, how do you avoid burnout in yourselves? You, you just have to hope the developers sort of burn out and give up before you guys uh, run out of steam. I'm, um, I'm like a really bad loser. <laughs> so, uh, I'm pretty, I'm, I mean, I say we haven't, yeah, we've all we've been pretty we've been pretty successful so far in the campaigns we've run in Snowdonia. Yeah. Um, obviously, this we're running a big campaign now in Austria, which doesn't you know Austrian politics are, are messy, and I'm not entirely convinced we're going to win. And but I think we're going to need to we're going to need to definitely um, do our best. You, you, you know, I I'm not going to give up until the the last minute it's not not the sort of person um in all honesty i'm never going to really call it quits it's always going to be oh no but maybe we could just do this or maybe we could just do this because i don't know how you could you could live with yourself if you if you didn't try everything you could possibly do you know how could you how could you drive past your local river and see a digger in the river you know like 
pouring concrete into it if you haven't done absolutely everything you could do. There's that really good film, isn't there, by Patagonia of um, the Balkan rivers. Is that a Patagonia film yeah. where they're all stood there, you know, um, linking arms and chaining themselves? To... Yeah, Blue Heart. Yeah, that's um, yeah. with the women on the bridge. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to stop the women of the provincia. Yeah, that's it. Good, good pronunciation. Um, and do yeah, you... probably. <laughs> Have you found that the the you know, Ben's asking here the 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 big organisation, big NGOs and you know governments and you know the big boys? How do they how do they find you know a, a bunch of smelly kayakers to deal with? Do they you know, obviously you're not presenting yourself like that, but do 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 the do they listen to the the small organisation? I, I think a lot of a lot of the stuff we deal with and the reason that we set up and that you know we started Save Our Rivers is that nobody was campaigning on the rivers that we wanted to save. You know, you're not going to get you're not going to get Greenpeace or WWF to come and spend you know all these man hours you know on one river in Slovenia or you, it's just not going to happen. They're not they're not going to be committed enough to do that. They're looking at bigger picture issues. So the stuff that we do was really things that were falling through the gaps. Um, you know, we're not. We're not, you know, I'm not going to pretend that Save Our Rivers is saving the world. We're, we're really not. But what we are doing is we're saving little pockets of it at a time. And those big NGOs don't don't really involve themselves. You know, they might they might deal with the, the loss of an entire forest, but they're not going to deal with the loss of 50 trees from a small patch of ancient woodland on the Klugwe. You know, that it's too small a fry for them. And and that meant that. We were losing these places bit by bit and it was kind of a death from a thousand cuts sort of situation going on so so we don't interact with those large ngos a lot uh the Uts is one big um example where we are we're working really closely with wwf austria on that one um but i'm not sure how much of that is a wwf austria policy and how much of that as is the Tyrol representative, the Tyrol employee for WWF Austria is massively engaged. And I think she's driving a lot of that uh, as a, you know, through her own personal commitment to the cause. Uh, I think as a big organization, it would probably pass them by. So we, we interact with them, that, you, know, on a, you know, on a huge level. So. Cool. Um... Yeah, and um, so everything's changing pretty quickly, isn't it, at the moment with um, with Brexit and now uh, coronavirus and all this all this stuff. So um, I guess on in terms of like the regulations in Britain, you said they're they're pretty good at the moment. Do you think that yeah. change? And is there work that's required to to make sure that 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 you know during the whole Brexit process we don't um, lose sight of what's really important? And, and now yeah, definitely. And there's NGOs doing that at the moment. So, so what's happening basically with environmental regulation in the UK is we're taking all the environmental laws that we have under Europe. So European Habitats Directive, European Water Framework Directive, European Bathing Water Directive. And we're just porting those from Europe straight into UK law. Uh, so in theory, they're being just copied just, just straight across and we will have the same level of environmental law we have in Europe and there's a lot of opportunities to improve things you know by changing um, uh, you know, agricultural subsidies within the UK to make them more payment for environmental good or changing fishing quotas to allow um, you know marine conservation zones in a way that they're not allowed at the moment so there's a lot of opportunities with Brexit to to improve our environmental regulation as well but also there's a lot of opportunities for those European laws as they get copied across to be weakened. Uh, so there's a lot of work done by um, NGOs at the moment to check how that those laws are being transcribed. Uh, and a lot of them, have, as they're being transcribed, are being kind of insidiously weakened uh, as they come across. And I know Woodland Trust had a real worry about protection from ancient woodland being downgraded from um, the legal language is is complicated, but from a from an absolute law to kind of a duty to consider, you know, there's a lot of little wishy washy changes that are happening as the laws are transcribed, and there's some some NGOs doing some really good work making sure that's not happening. But I think that some of that will happen. And then the big worry for 
for it after the event is if what you know if we have this new version of water framework directive under british law and it's not under european law anymore is when that is broken who do we go to to complain so at the moment we have a right to make um a free objection to the ecj the european court of justice about a developer or a regulator breaking water framework directive i'm unsure what our abilities to do that will be post brexit so there's a lot of worry that that yeah we'll have these new laws but if they're broken we're not quite sure what we're going to do to yeah. to have them enforced so. yeah no, that's one of one of the questions from um Barra here actually that's uh, on that really is that how yeah how liable are these organizations for what the, the the damage they do if people um end up destroying ancient woodland what yeah what we're seeing do we're, about it? we're seeing huge issues with that through the planning process so we're having uh there's a really good example here there was a hydro scheme called um oh, oh blimey, i can't remember what it's called. there's a hydro scheme in the clamberis pass that was built with the commitment that all the pipe work and the concrete for the dam is going to get helicoptered into the top. They weren't going to fell any trees. They were going to hand dig the trenching for the pipeline down to the main road. And it got passed. Yeah. And then all, as soon as it got passed, they bulldozed the road to the top of the river, drove all the stuff up on a truck, cut down loads of trees, and basically broke all the planning constraints that, that they, they committed to, to, to have this thing passed. And so then the planning authority said, right, well, you've got to stop works. Uh, you know, we're going to sue you for this. And they, and, and they basically declared themselves bankrupt and said, well, you can either let us build it. We'll, we'll apply for planning in retrospect to all the things that we've done that we didn't have planning for to start with. Back then all these trees and, stuff. and if you don't grant that, we'll just declare ourselves bankrupt and walk away from it like a devastated site. Um, if you do grant us planning in retrospect, we won't go bankrupt and we'll restore the site a little bit uh and that happens a lot okay. that happens at, you know that's a really common tactic with, with developers to put in really stringent environmental uh construction method statements knowing that they will definitely break them and then get away with it so that's yeah that's a that's a real that's a real problem and you can't say to the planning authority this shouldn't be passed because we know they're going to break their construction method statement because the planning authority says yeah but they say they're not going to and we have to judge them on that you know we have to judge them on what their application says and happens time and time and time again so yeah it's a real it's a real worry it's a real problem interesting um have you seen a change with um claire's asking here about uh, the snowdonia national park authority have they have you seen a change in their attitude towards dams since you started working with them yes a little bit yeah they're definitely becoming more they're starting to understand that construction method statements will be broken routinely as as part of that they are they do get that now because they've seen enough of that happen they now understand that there are people out there that are going to actually read planning applications and complain and this that's mostly through us and another NGO called the Snowdonia Society do fantastic work on this as well, not just around rivers, but in other planning aspects too. And we work really closely with the Snowdonia Society on the river based ones. And they do get the fact that that what they have been passing is has been unsustainable and has been wrong and mistakes have been made in terms of what they've committed. And they are more careful now than they used to be. Good. Which is good, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um so Go on. Yeah, so I mean, from 2011 till now, Snowdonia Park Authority permitted 90 hydro schemes to be built all within the national park, most of which were in triple SIs or SAC special areas of conservation. And if you add up the uh, total generating capacity of all of those 90 hydro schemes, it's less than one large offshore wind turbine. So you know they're they're sort of they were allowing the piecemeal destruction of all our river systems for less energy than a windmill so that's, i guess with all these things there's going to be a trade-off isn't there but that sounds um sounds skewed in the wrong direction yeah 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 um, yeah brilliant um 
So we're, we're coming up to nine o'clock, but if um, people are happy to, to, to stay on for a few more minutes, I think we've probably got um, quite a few more questions to answer. If anyone's got any other questions and they want to fire them in before we uh, got a few yeps coming in here yet, we'll stay on a little bit longer. Yeah, go for it. Why not? I've got a second here. Um, go for a minute. Brilliant. Go for a few more minutes. Um, we're, um, I'm kind of interested in, in, in the whole coronavirus thing because, you know, because of the, um, the increase of, of people enjoying the outdoors um, and whether it's an opportunity um, for you guys um, and, and all of us who love the outdoors or is it going to lead to, you know, people kind of thinking, well, um, you know, while, while uh, everyone's distracted, I'm going to build a dam or I'm going to, you know, um, look, look after myself. Yeah, I mean, I, we've, I think we've been seeing the, the bad side of it. I mean, I've already mentioned that in, in, um, in Austria, they moved in to start this project, which has been underway for 15 years, when, when they knew nobody could protest to it. So we're seeing, you know, projects being brought forward to avoid protesters. And that's happening in the UK a lot with the HS2 sites, the clearing of ancient woodland for HS2. Yeah. There's a lot of really good um, kind of more direct action activists out there um, at HS2 sites at the moment trying to prevent damage to ancient woodland. And big, res You know, that's not the way that we operate, but massive respect to, to what those guys are doing. Uh, and that's developers using coronavirus curfews to keep protesters away. Um, we, uh, I've still got, still got to pay it, but we were fined uh, by the, our cameraman was fined by the Austrian police for breaking coronavirus curfew whilst filming the building of the dam that's being built in Austria without legal permits. And we've got a 400 euro fine to pay for that. So I, I know that at least two illegal hydro schemes being built in Bosnia uh, under coronavirus curfews because nobody can go out and stop them. Yeah. Uh, and th th those are hydro schemes without any government permission or permits. It's just mm. developers going into an area and building a scheme and trying to get permission for it afterwards. So, so I'm not, you know, I'm not one of these ones that, you know, oh, look, the birds are singing louder. Isn't nature doing great under coronavirus? It's not, yeah. it's not working like that. And then obviously the big worry is, is when the recovery comes it, and we're seeing it in the States uh, under Trump and we're seeing it with, uh, you know, some of the trade negotiations that may be going on with the US and the UK in terms of agriculture, like environmental standards to allow a speedier economic recovery, I think is a real worry. Um, so with my pessimistic head on, I don't think it's going to be good news. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, funny because from the outside you think, well, more people in the outdoors, that's good, greater awareness. But it's only any good if we all get engaged, I suppose, and go out and, 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 and make some noise and do some work. Um, yes, definitely, yeah. I'm Just going to the beach and leaving your barbecue there is not helping anyone. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've got to do something useful afterwards. Um, no, that's really interesting. Um, so in terms of like, um, you know, number one thing we can do, you know, if I was going to, get up tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning and go right let's do something to, to to move this forward what what's the one thing that i could do i mean i'm the, the big thing that i'm trying to push and it's not just me uh you know a really good friend of mine lauren runs the textile winters uk uh and she you know it's her message as well is the fact that we need systemic change you know it's all very well making personal commitments to do your recycling or not fly on holiday or anything like that mm. or, or eat less meat or, or whatever that's all great and it does need to be done but none of that is going to is going to save the planet we've just had this enormous experiment called coronavirus where we've grounded all global aviation and we nobody gets to drive their cars anywhere and nobody goes on holiday and you can't you know you can't buy half the stuff you used to buy and yet we've only cut carbon emissions by between about five and six percent globally so that shows you the limitation of personal choices what you need to do is get involved in systemic change and we can do you know we can make systemic change by um engaging in the planning system you know that's the way we do it or legis or consultations on legislation 
you can engage in systemic change by the way you vote or by moving your bank account to another bank account you know one thing you could do you know you would you would save more carbon by moving your pension provider to an ethical environmental pension provider uh, that doesn't invest in fossil fuels than you would do by not flying anywhere on holiday so these are the systemic things that you can make. so who do you vote for where do you spend your money uh where do you have your money stored either in your pension or your, or your bank account and engage in those those legal those legal processes that's that's what we want systemic change cool that's really interesting um yeah we've actually found out the other day uh, bristol airports owned by um by a teacher's pension fund in america it's like there's now this big campaign with school children writing to the school children in america somewhere saying can you stop investing in all this it's quite yeah cool. yeah definitely yeah so is there any um any other campaigns we've got uh, Claire's asking any good campaigns that have really grabbed your attention um recently from other organizations that you've, you've seen uh let me think. I mean, um, ah, oh, that's a tricky one. Uh, I mean, obviously, the all the stuff through, um, you know, uh, Fridays for Future through school kids was was incredible. I think getting the next generation engaged is. Um, on that level is something that I never imagined would have happened. So massive respect to all the people that have, that have been involved in that. And not just because of when these kids are older, they'll, they'll act differently because it's going to be too late by then. But the pressure that these, that kids can put on their parents or put on their, you know, that's, that's been fantastic. You know, that, that sudden and massive level of empowerment of children, I think has been that's massively fun. yeah 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 um and um i guess like you kind of see you, you've spoken with loads of passion about it you clearly you know you're, you're you're clearly getting something out of it as well um i think you mentioned earlier um you know what what are the main you know is it going to improve my my paddling if i learn a little bit more about it is it gonna is it gonna make a difference to how i you know how i see my local spots i guess i guess so yeah, I reckon, like I was saying, you know, when you're, when you're out paddleboarding, being able to understand and appreciate the nature around you and have some information about that is going to, it's only going to add to your enjoyment of your, of your sport. I certainly think that since I've been involved in activism around rivers, I've enjoyed kayaking more than I ever have done before. You know, I, I think that it's, environmental activism has given me like a whole extra layer of enjoyment and engagement with the sport that, mm. that I didn't think um, that maybe I don't know I'm cracking on a bit and um, there's not that many people who are still kayaking like I kayak and have that passion for it in in their 40s I suppose and I think that turning to environmental activism five or six years ago has really helped me maintain that drive that I've got. I think it's, um, yeah, it's worth it. You know, it's, it's every bit that I do, you know, in terms of protecting the place makes me enjoy it more when I go there. Brilliant. Um, just a couple of uh, really quick sort of technical things. And I'm sure that um, afterwards we can um, you know, get some further reading together and put it on, on Facebook or whatever, a few links, but, um, any moves to remove dams at all? Um, who's asking this? Yeah, question? so there's an NGO called Dam Removal Europe, oh, yeah. uh, and they work for local partners. So they don't remove dams themselves, but they work by funding, empowering, and linking up local partners. So in the UK, that would be the Rivers Trusts, mostly, whoever your local Rivers Trust is. Your local Rivers Trust, Tim, I don't know if you know those guys, Bristol and Avon, are really engaged. They're probably one of the kind of youngest, coolest, most uh, passionate Rivers Trust that, that, you know, that I've met. Um, and same with like Ribble Rivers Trust and stuff like that do a lot. So that tends to be the removal of, in this country, like defunct river barriers. So 
we're building new dams for hydropower here, but the old version of that was building dams and weirs for industrial processes, cotton mills, uh, quarrying, you know, ironwork, stuff like that. And there's a lot of work to remove those old industrial structures now and open up sections of river and free flowing again. Um, and then there's a massive dam about to be removed in France, which is part of the Dam Removal Europe project. Um, so that's something that's done in Europe. And in the States, there's an NGO called American Rivers that are restoring a lot of um, a lot of river systems there. They removed, they did the biggest dam removal ever there a few years back on the Elwa. They blew up an enormous dam. So if you watch the you can see that, can't you? You can you can see that in that film. And um, do they go back to how they used to be? Does it how long does it take to Yeah, I, I mean I think what's super amazing about rivers is how quickly they restore themselves. Because because it isn't just waiting, it isn't just about wildlife kind of moving back in, you know, trees regrowing. River systems are driven by natural processes. The processes of erosion and deposition of sediment drive river systems. And those processes restart instantly the minute you were Wow. Well, uh, I think two years after the dam removed, had salmon running back into that river again for the first time in 60 years or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, the restoration is possible and it's fast. Brilliant. Good news. A um, couple more quick ones. A couple of people asking about further reading. Um, we'll definitely get some links up and we'll make this um, recording available as well um, so that um, you can you can listen. Yeah, back. I think if people are like, I'm just trying to see if I've got it on my shelf. If you're, if you're really interested in impacts of particularly large scale hydro and the social impacts of that, in terms of, you know, something like hydropower since, you know, since the Second World War has displaced something like 14 million people. It's, it's the social impacts of hydropower through China and India are enormous. And probably the best book on that is, is this one. So this is uh, Silence Rivers by Patrick McCulley. Now, Patrick mcculley has gone on to, he was an academic. It's kind of an academic book, but it's quite easy to read. Mm -hmm. he, on to be a big player in American rivers now in a river restoration NGO. Um, it's out of print, but you can get it on Amazon Marketplace still. That's an amazing book uh, in terms of, yeah, it's a bit out of date now. So, but all the science that's been found out since Silence Rivers was published shows dams to be worse than he thought they were, and he thought they were pretty bad. So that's, like, so that, that's a really good one. Um, and then in terms of, again, impacts of, of like large dams and looking else, what, what else is on the bookshelf? Uh, there's a really good book by the lady who wrote God of Small Things. Uh, oh, Anderati Roy. Yes, you're right. She, she wrote a book called The Greater Good which is about a large dam project going on in India. Um, and that, that's an amazing book as well, about social impacts. And, and so that's a good one. But right. Science Rivers is where I'd start, you know, if you're interested. That's a really good book. Nice. Um, got James saying uh, River Republic. Have you seen that? R River Republic? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good book too. Yeah, yeah. Great. So yeah, there's, um, yeah, there's, some really, there's, some, there's some really good reading out there. And check out um, River Watch is a European NGO fighting against hydro schemes in Europe. They've got some really good scientific, uh, really good scientific um, journal articles and stuff. You know, peer-reviewed science on that website. Which is, which is nice. really um, so just before we go, um, human health. How does that tie in with all of this? Um, Georgie's asking: um, Is it time that healthcare needs to get more involved in environmental engagement and activism as well? Oh, so this is, uh, hang on, let me read the question. How do you think human health ties in with this? And do you think it's time that can be seen more and more? Yeah, I think so. I think, well, oh, I don't know. Oh, tricky. Actually, when you more you think about it. Um, I think I'm probably a little bit bipolar anyway. And I think I probably have my happiest moments through engaging in nature and the outdoors and environmental activism. 
and probably also my most stressed out and annoyed and angry moments in dealing with environmental activism. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, maybe it's, maybe getting into environmental activism is not great. It's like, not, not really. <laughs> yeah, swings and roundabouts on that one. Oh, amazing. So um, I think we'll uh, we'll kind of call it a day with questions there. Um, Dan, thank you so much. That's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm sure everyone will agree. Um, brilliant. So much knowledge and, and passion and enthusiasm as well. I really want to pick your brain some more. Um, my takeaway, I guess, is that it's, um, I guess, we just could all benefit by being more invested, by appreciating kind of where we play a little bit more and really kind of starting to take a stand to protect it a little bit more. And I guess that's what, what I'm gonna be doing, um, I hope. Um, so um, yeah, it would be really great as well, like before you guys go, just if you have got a takeaway sort of um, thought or opinion or something that you think you might do, um, it'd be really interesting to stick it in the, in the comments before you go, um, just for us to have a, have a little look through that as well. Um, and um, thank you, Dan, thanks again for, for that, that was amazing. Um, no, cheers, cheers for having us on guys, it's great absolutely brilliant to have you um if you if you guys are interested in, in any more of these sort of discussions and debates and um and ideas um we're uh, hosting an event in october i think i mentioned at the beginning um a paddle industry day um and it's going to include speakers um like um chris hines we mentioned earlier um i think he's the first surfer to get an mbe maybe he's started uh, surfers against sewage um and he's a bit of a legend um sean sykes from psych paddleboarding um and various others as well. And um, that will be in real life. We can have these discussions in real life. It's going to be amazing. Um, we may be able to persuade Dan to come down. You never know. Um, I, I, yeah, I've had, a, I've had an invite. Uh, it, it depends on the date of it because we've got, uh, we're hoping to organize or be part of organizing a big river protest stroke festival out on the Uts in Austria at the beginning of October. So, so it'll, hopefully I'll get to do both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, so I hopefully see you guys some of, some of you there. Um, and we're hoping this, we're, host, uh, we're hosting the SUP symposium that we do every year with coaching sessions, tours, um, and the like um, over the weekend after that. So yeah, it'd be amazing to see you guys, and we'll release more information about that um, in the next few weeks. Um, so yeah, we've got a few um, kind of takeaway facts here from people. So thank you ever so much for putting those in to the chat. Um, Thanks again. Thanks to Dan. Thanks to Save Our Rivers. And thanks to you guys for all contributing, asking loads of questions. Um, I'm really sorry we couldn't get to all of them. It turns out it's kind of hard to, to keep track of the, the, the chat coming in and have a conversation. So thank you so much for those of you that, that did ask stuff. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to everything. Um, we're going to put links in the follow-up email to all the stuff we discussed um, and also some more information on Save Our Rivers and what you guys can, can do to get involved near you. Um, thanks again and um, hope to see you soon. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. Thank you. Really great to chat. How do I turn it off? <laughs> such, oh, I'm, such, I'm such an old man when it comes to this stuff. There we go. Oh, there's a leave button. Right. Cheers, guys. Thanks Good. a lot. Thank you, everyone. Cheers, Cheers Dan. See you soon.